imaging is the measurement of brain responses, responses to changes in stimuli, changes in mood. Um, in fact, anything you think of that the brain can do, then you can challenge the brain experimentally and then measure how the brain responds, responds to those challenges. The imaging bit uh, comes from the fact that the brain has a particular architecture, a particular anatomy. So certain parts of the brain are specialised for uh, performing certain functions. So for example, there's a particular part of my brain, largely about here, that's specifically engaged by uh, visual motion, so watching moving things and analysing and processing that information to try and infer or work out the causes of those visual uh, visual sensations. To know that, you have to be able to measure the whole brain and establish which parts of those brains respond selectively to the particular attribute or the particular function that you're interested in. So that requires a measurement of brain responses. And that's essentially what we do here at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging at University College London. There are a number of different ways that one can measure brain responses. They can roughly fall into two um, classes. The first are um, measurements that depend upon the brain's energy supply and blood supply. So clearly if you're using your brain to process sensory information, say visual information, that requires energy, it requires work, and in fact the brain um, accounts for a considerable proportion of the body's energy budget and that work is localised. So there's an increase, a blushing, if you like, of different parts of the brain in response to processing that sort of information, for example, visual motion. That can be measured if you can assess the local blood flow or the consequences of that non-invasively, by which I mean measuring from outside the skull. Um, and well, a lot of the work that we do uh, here at the uh, Wellcome Trust Centre is to measure the blood flow or the hemodynamic responses in terms of subtle changes in magnetic fields or the signals produced by the differences in the uh, 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 the magnetic behaviour of blood before and after it has given up its oxygen to the nervous tissue so that it can do the processing, do the neuronal firing. So that means if we can scan a brain within say one or two seconds in one condition and then scan again in the, second, uh, in the next little um, portion of time, um, we can get a picture of fluctuations in blood flow or in the energy uh, consumption at each point in the brain. And then by looking at the patterns of fluctuations in the blood flow responses and the patterns of stimulation that we provide to our subjects or possibly patients, uh, then we can see whether, the, which that, whether that part of the brain is engaged by the particular stimuli. So I could present to you uh, for a several seconds a, uh, a, a picture, a still picture of say dots. And then I could suddenly make the dots move. And I can measure your brain activity in terms of its metabolic activity during the period of static viewing and the equivalent activity during the, mo the, uh, the processing of the moving dots. And then by comparing the patterns of activity throughout the brain, basically by subtracting the stationary condition from the moving dot condition, I can isolate those parts of the brain that were more active during the moving dots paradigm. And then I can infer that that part of the brain was specialised for processing visual motion. That notion and that basic paradigm can be generalised to any sensory, motor, cognitive, emotional processing or situation that you can imagine. Um, so we can um, look at the correlates, the hemodynamic correlates, the blood flow correlates,
of working memory, of processing various uh, emotional stimuli like fa fearful faces. Uh, we can look at the, um, the correlates of being in different brain states, for example, being depressed or not being depressed or being elated and not being, being elated, anxious. And in this way, one can build up literally a map. And very often people have described much of early brain imaging as a cartography, a, a map building exercise that allows you to assign various functions to functionally specialised parts of the brain, thereby creating a uh, literally an atlas or a map of which parts of the brain do what and ultimately how different parts of the brain talk to each other. So you're building a picture of functional anatomy, an anatomy of function of processing information, uh, I repeat, from right from the sensory processing right through to the cognitive operations such as attention and memory to get a holistic and global picture of how the brain works. Now, I said at the beginning that these brain imaging technologies come in two flavours. So I've been talking about um, techniques that rest upon um, functional magnetic resonance imaging or positron emission tomography. So these are literally um, devices that provide or offer you an image, a snapshot of brain activity at one point in time, usually over several seconds. Um, so what, we're not, what we are looking at are not the actual very fast fluctuations in electromagnetic activity that nerve cells engage in, uh, all the fast synaptic processes that mediate neural processing, but the energy supply that is necessary to sustain that level of information processing or message passing. And the fluctuations in that energy supply are in the order of four to five seconds. So we're looking at fluctuations over quite extended periods of time. We can do that with exquisite spatial precision. So we can, you know, the, um, the little elements that constitute the entire brain imaging can be as small as a few millimeters. So we can measure almost down to the resolution of a few millimetres, the specific responses to various experimental paradigms. But clearly, there's very little temporal acuity, there's very little temporal precision in these sorts of measurements because the way that your brain works uh, is on a time scale that's measured in milliseconds. You notice things, you, you, you think and you move on a time scale uh, where things happen several times a second, if not several times you know, uh, every few hundred milliseconds. So now we turn to the other sort of brain imaging, which is the, uh, the measurement of the actual electrical and magnetic signals generated by the nervous activity, the nerve cell activity itself. And these fluctuate very, very quickly. Um, so if I were to present to you a single dot visually, and I left it uh, on the screen for, say, 50 milliseconds, that would create a barrage of nervous impulses that would propagate from your eyes through various uh, subcortical structures to the back of the brain and then bounce forward and go everywhere each part of the brain taking from it, or um, some people would say trying to predict uh, the causes of that sensory information that are provided to you. And in doing that, what you see are fast fluctuations in the electromagnetic field that can be picked up by sensors that are placed either on the scalp or if they're magnetic sensors uh, slightly distant from the scalp to get a picture from very different points of view of these fast fluctuations, ripples in electromagnetic activity that are different at every point in the brain. So this would be electromagnetic brain imaging. It would be um, uh, the sort of imaging um, that you will associate with uh, um, uh, EEG or um, magnetoencephalography or electroencephalography that measures respectively the magnetic and the electrical consequences of this nervous uh, activity, this, uh, this um, neuronal firing induced by experimental design. That's a form of brain imaging which has exquisite temporal precision, but you can see immediately that looking 
from the outside in at a very complicated spatial arrangement of coupled neuronal responses playing out on a time scale of a few hundred milliseconds is a very difficult picture to interpret unless you can go in and assign your measurements to various parts of the brain. That's a very difficult problem. It's called the, uh, the, uh, an inverse problem, basically trying to reconstruct the pattern of electromagnetic activity across the brain that best explains your sensory measurements from the sensors placed on the outside of the brain. However, that can be done uh, with some, some assumptions. So you can build or reconstruct a picture of distributed neuronal activity on almost a millisecond by millisecond timescale that allows you then to interrogate and understand not the spatial deployment of uh, neuronal responses, but their temporal anatomy, the succession of uh, responses um, in terms of which areas pass information to other areas and then other areas pass information back, creating a succession of little waves. And sometimes in continuously processing um, information, these waves constitute oscillations. So there's a whole field of reconstructing, creating images of the brain in action in an ongoing way uh, by characterizing the neuronal activity that you've induced by asking subjects, say, to, to move uh, coherently moving visual stimuli or dots uh, in terms of the frequencies with which you're engaging the neural activity. And there are all sorts of interesting questions about the physiology and the anatomy of that message passing that can be addressed at this fine time scale. So in conclusion, brain imaging is in the game of acquiring measurements that inform our understanding of how the brain passes messages um, of a neuronal sort from one part of the brain to the other in order to make sense of the world. And we've got two ways of doing that. We can either look at the spatial deployment of the energetics that are induced by neuronal processing using technologies like magnetic resonance imaging or positron emission tomography or we can get into the detailed temporal structure by looking, looking at electromagnetic uh, responses using sensors that are external to the brain.